We do recognize today that in the life of the church, this is the last Sunday of the Christian year, a Sunday that has been marked as Christ the King Sunday. And I'm reminded of a devotional that I read um, from Diana Butler Bass, where she said, she doesn't much care for Christ the King Sunday because the power of kings in our world today is not one that we easily identify with. We know that there is so much pain and discomfort in our world as we heard through the heartfelt prayer that Austin shared with us today. Today, many of you know, is also a day of remembrance for transgender persons who were murdered this past year. You'll notice the pink and blue ribbons on the fence outside of our church building with names of those persons listed on those ribbons. There is so much grief, so much pain, and so, dis so much discomfort in our world. But on Christ the King Sunday, what I hope we will all hold on to is the fact that we are not alone in this world and that God has given to each one of us gifts of time, talent, and treasure to be God's ministers of peace, love, hope, and justice in this world. And so as we conclude our stewardship sermon series, it is my hope and my prayer that we'll continue to be guided by that light of God's love in this world. Let us pray. Dear God of grace and comfort, God of strength and love, as we gather together in this sanctuary, may the warmth of your love touch our hearts deeply. Use the words of my mouth and the meditations in our hearts and minds to stir us that we might be brighter and stronger and bolder examples workmen in your kingdom, so that your will might be done on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. Our scripture lesson today continues in the book of James in the New Testament. I hope you've been able to read through this book with me during these last couple of weeks. James lifts up for us the ways that we can show our faith by the ways that we live. And here in the third chapter, beginning at the 13th verse, he talks about wisdom. Are any of you wise and understanding? Show your actions are good with a humble lifestyle that comes from wisdom. However, if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition in your heart, then stop bragging and living in ways that deny the truth. This is not the wisdom that comes down from above. Instead, it is from the earth, natural and demonic. Wherever there is disorder, jealousy, and selfish ambition, there is disorder in everything that is evil. What of the wisdom from above? First, it is pure and then peaceful, gentle, obedient, filled with mercy and good actions, fair and genuine. Those who make peace sow seeds of justice by their peaceful acts. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Well, if you've been around here for very long, you've heard the name John Wesley. You know that John Wesley is credited with being the founder of the United Methodist Church. When John Wesley was only six years old, the parsonage in which he lived, the parsonage is the home that was owned by the church, the Anglican Church of which his father was a priest, the parsonage that he and his family lived in, caught on fire. 
The alarm was sounded, and his parents thought that they had gotten everyone out of the house. But when they started counting their children, they discovered that one of their children had not made it out of the house. And to their horror, they saw little John Wesley, six-year-old John Wesley, in the upstairs window, caught inside of that burning building. The father, as I said, was a devout, scholarly Anglican minister. And when he saw his little boy in that burning hot house, he immediately dropped to his knees and he started praying that God would save his little boy. But John Wesley's mother was a person of great faith as well, and yet she had a very practical spirit. Immediately, what she did was, instead of dropping to her knees and praying, she ran over to her neighbor's house and got her neighbor to bring out a tall ladder and to come over to the house to lean it up against the house so that they could rescue her little boy from that flaming house. John Wesley wrote that that was a life-changing event for him. It taught him that there are times when the best way to express our faith is to get up off of our knees and to do something. Faith, the book of James tells us, is shown to the world and acted out in relationships in our everyday lives. When we do this, James says, we are living guided by a heavenly wisdom instead of the wisdom of the world that says, just look out for number one. When we are guided by heavenly wisdom, our faith shows. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read the word wisdom in the Bible, instead of thinking of something lofty that I may never be able to attain, I think about choices, choices that we make. Because the Bible tells us that the wise person chooses to do good, and the foolish person chooses to do that which is evil and harmful in this world. A wise person is one who makes good choices in life. And we make choices each and every day that impact not only our lives, but the lives of others around us. And so James, in the text that we read today, says that when we live by heavenly wisdom... Our goal is one of peace, being those who work for peace. Instead of living by the world standards where there is competition and there are winners and losers, we strive to be at peace with everyone. We make decisions that don't cause that kind of tension in our relationships. Heavenly wisdom is considerate, and that means that our choices are based on how our choices affect other people. Heavenly wisdom, James also says, is submissive, meaning that we put others first, the needs of others before our own needs. And it is merciful, building up other people. Heavenly wisdom bears good fruit, James says, the good fruit of love, joy, kindness, patience, goodness, self-control, faithfulness, and gentleness. And healthy wisdom is impartial. You know, too many decisions that we, ba that we make in our world today are based on what we can get out of others or out of the investment that we make. But healthy wisdom makes choices that are impartial to whether or not we get anything back. We do what is right and what is good. It is sincere. 
out of a deep desire to follow Christ's rule of love, loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, and loving our neighbor as ourselves. Or as John Wesley said, it is doing all the good we can to all the people we can in all the places we can at all the times we can in all the ways we can for as long as ever we can. Heavenly wisdom is what we are called to live by. And I believe that loving God, loving neighbor, and loving ourselves by doing good, doing no harm, and staying in love with God demands of us at least these three things. It demands first that our speech is always grace-filled. That when we talk about other people or when we talk about things in this world, that our speech is filled with grace. Not judgment, not demeaning others, not bitterness, not hate, but with grace. You know, a few years ago, I was preaching at a friend's church. She had invited me to come. Her little country church had what they call revival services. Some of you remember revival services. These were evening services at her church, and she invited me to come for three consecutive evenings and to preach in her church. I was honored to do so. On one of those nights, she had one of the high school students give a testimony, an opening devotional, and I was very touched by this young lady's devotional. She spoke of love as a key sign and a key symbol of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ, and she encouraged all of us to be thoughtful, to be considerate, to be kind to everyone that we meet, met. And she finished her talk by quoting the Apostle Paul, from 1 Corinthians 13. And so we were all very impressed with her deep faith and love and her challenge to each one of us to love one another. I then stood up and gave my sermon for the night and greeted people at the door. And as I walked out to my car, I saw that young teenage girl about to get into the car with her mother. And I started to walk over to her to thank her for the words that she said that night. But as I approached her car, I heard the most horrible things come out of her mouth as she berated her own mother. As she called her mother names that I dare not repeat. As she said things to her mother about her mother embarrassing her as she said things that were so unloving. I hung my head down, and I thought, Dear Lord Jesus, we all need to practice what we preach. Practice what we preach. Our speech should always be gracious, always gracious in this world. If we live by the rule of love, our words should always reflect that love to everyone we meet and in every word that people hear from us. People in this world are looking at those of us who say we are followers of Christ. And if our lives do not show what we profess with our lips, why would they ever want to follow our King Jesus? Secondly, I believe that we are called to be gracious in serving others. One of my all-time favorite stories is about a woman from Birmingham who on a cold winter's night was walking in the downtown area where she lived. She saw a little boy who was standing on a grating just outside of a bakery it was snowing and sleeting, and this little boy did not have on a coat. He was also barefooted, no socks, no shoes. He was standing on that grating outside of the bakery trying to get some heat that was being generated as the people in the bakery were baking their goods. He had on a tattered T-shirt and worn-out jeans, and the lady's heart just broke for that little boy. She walked over to him and she asked him, 
where his coat was, where his shoes were, where his socks were. And he said, ma'am, I don't have any. She said, come with me. She grabbed his little hand and she walked with him a few doors down to a little department store and she went in and she bought him a nice coat, shoes, and socks. The little boy was so pleased and so proud as he put on that coat and as he put on those shoes and those socks. And he looked up to the lady and he said, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. She blushed a little bit and he said, I have a question to ask you. And she said, sure, what is it? He said, are you God's wife? She didn't know how to answer. But then this thought came to her. She said, no, I'm not God's wife, but I'm one of his children. And the little boy beamed and he said, I knew you were kin to God. See, gracious service tells people we are kin to God. It tells people that we follow that rule of love, loving others. You know, this building may be cold today, but it's not because we wanted it to be cold. There were people who were here this morning trying to get the heat on for us before any of us walked into the doors of this sanctuary. There were people who were trying to make sure that this place would be warm for us this morning. This place is beautifully adorned because there were people who came here in the week to make sure that the pews were clean and well stocked with supplies that you needed. Sam and Jean spent untold hours putting together this beautiful altar display. Janet Cotter helped putting together beauty for us to worship. These choir members behind me came in early today and sang in this cold sanctuary, rehearsing for us so that we could hear these beautiful songs and be led in singing of God's glory Sunday school classes were prepared. Ann Jessup contacted me earlier in the week to ask about the sermon to, for today so that she could be prepared to lead the children in the children's message. Our children have been trained on how to light the candles and extinguish the candles to remind us that Christ is the light of the world. There are so many ways that people in this church serve serve out of that rule of love to help us worship God in this place at this time. Living by heavenly wisdom means that we are gracious in our speech and we are generous in our service. But it also means that we are generous in our giving. Now I know that it's tempting to be silent when it comes to money especially when we talk about money in the church. We dance around it. We talk in generalities. We talk about the budget and the need to pay the bills. We don't want to talk about money too much in the church, but we know that it costs money to do ministry in the church just as it costs money to do things in our lives. It's difficult sometimes to talk about money. It reminds me of a story of a third grade teacher who asked her class to solve a math problem. The teacher said, suppose you had 99 cents and your friend had $99. What would be the difference? And the little girl said, the dismal point. <laughs> now you know she meant the decimal point. But the dismal point, sometimes it does seem dismal. Dismal when we think about people who don't have enough money, people who are struggling because of the way the economy is today. It's not funny at all noticing the people who have difficulty financially making ends meet and keeping warm, keeping food on their table, keeping gas in their cars so they can get to work. 
And yet still, we need to talk about money in the church. You know, I remember many, many years ago hearing a sermon from one of my pastors, and he said the most dangerous item that any of us owns is not a shotgun that we may have in our homes that might accidentally discharge, and it's not a swimming pool in our backyard that someone might accidentally drown in. It's not our automobiles that might get in an accident on the highways. It's our bank account. Because our bank account has the power to capture our souls. Perhaps that's why the Bible itself talks so much about money. Do you know there are over 500 verses on prayer? There are less than 500 verses on faith. But there are more than 2,000 verses about money and what money can buy in this world. So it can be argued there's a mo no more religious subject than money. See, if we live by heavenly wisdom, we're going to be generous in our giving, not just by serving with our time, but we'll be generous when giving of our finances. One of the stories that touches me every year as I get ready to fill out our pledge card about the tithes that we will give to the church, I'm reminded of a trip that I went on several years ago. I went on a mission trip to Honduras in Central America. Now, Honduras is a beautiful country, and the people are beautiful there. There are some people who live in Honduras who are very well off and who live in very nice houses. But the village that I went to to work in was a village of the poorest of the poor people. They had nothing, nothing, literally. Their homes were homes with just dirt floors. Their furniture was all hard furniture. No overstuffed couches or recliners. Nothing fluffy. They slept on those dirt floors. They had no paintings on their walls. What they had on their walls were little greeting cards that missionaries who'd been there before had sent to them and they just kind of tacked those greeting cards up on the wall. They washed their clothes in the river, and they went to the river and dipped out buckets of water that they took back to their home so that they would have water to cook with and to bathe with. Their churches were not beautiful like this one. Their churches were just concrete buildings, and the people stood for the entire worship service. But I remember going into one of those churches, and our guide who was with us told us that that church had about 30 people who attended every Sunday. It didn't look like it was big enough to hold 30 people. She said, oh no, they cram in here. It's so important to them, they wouldn't dare miss a Sunday. They gather in here and they worship God. They sing with smiles on their faces and joy in their hearts. You know, we worry so much about saving money for retirement. We hear about people living from paycheck to paycheck. We wonder about whether we have enough money to pay for medical emergencies. But these folks, they don't even think about retiring. They live day by day, day by day, and they just pray that medical emergencies don't come along. And yet, when they gather in that tiny little church and sing their songs, they always take up an offering. And our guide told us about one particular lady in that congregation. She said that every single Sunday, this dear lady who had no money at all wanted to make sure that she could participate in the offering. She wanted to make sure that she could give something to that offering. And so as the other people placed their coins in the offering plate, this dear lady would place a tiny little bag filled with rice grains of rice. 
According to our guide, if this woman had enough food to eat that week, each and every day she would take a portion of her rice and put it off to the side in a little napkin. That was her tithe. She'd place that rice every day if she had food to eat. And then she'd bring that little bag to church every Sunday. Can you imagine? You have food to eat on Monday, and it's just a little rice. But you take a tenth of that, and you put it off to the side so that you can feed other people. You do that on Tuesday. You do that on Wednesday. You do that on Thursday. You do that on Friday. But then it's Saturday. And you don't have any more rice to eat. But you've got that bag over there where you've put a tenth of your rice from Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. How tempting would it be to go to that bag and take out some of that rice and just eat it yourself? But this woman never did that. She was giving that to take care of others, and that was important to her because she lived by heavenly wisdom and the rule of love. She always brought that bag, and she placed it in that offering plate. When she was asked why she did that, this is what she said. I make this offering because I believe in God the Father Almighty who made heaven and earth, and I believe in Jesus Christ who came and died and rose again. I make this offering because I believe that God loves me and God loves others and God wants me to serve she wanted to give thanks to God for all that she had, and she wanted others to know that love. Our stewardship is about living by the rule of love, my friends, giving thanks to God for the things that we have been blessed with, being gracious in our speech, being generous with our service, and being generous with our giving. So I want you to take the cards that you brought with you, hopefully the card that you received in the mail. If you don't have one, like I say, Tommy and Alan John have extras in the back. If you've already filled out one and turned it in, thank you for that. If you filled it out online, thank you for that. But if you brought it with you today, I'm going to give you the opportunity when we sing our closing hymn to come forward to kneel if you'd like to be in prayer, and I will pray a blessing upon these gifts, gifts to be used for God's glory. These commitment cards, financial commitment cards, are a statement. They're a statement of our values, a statement of our belief in the rule of love, a statement of our willingness to share out of the abundance that God has given to us. I know that you've worked hard, you've studied hard, you've done the work to earn the money that you have, but none of us, if we're honest, started from scratch. We all started with a foundation of minds, and energy, and talents, and support from others that helped us to achieve what we have in this world today. And God offers us this opportunity to share, to share not just our financial resources, but to share our time and our talent, as so many have done throughout the history of this great congregation. If you've never filled out a pledge card before, I want to encourage you to fill out one today to just make that step of commitment. And I promise we don't have pledge card police. We're not going to follow up and say, ah, 
you said you would give five hours to teaching the youth and you haven't done it. You make the pledge out of honest relationship and conversation with God. And we trust that you follow where God leads you. In your financial giving, I want to remind you, you can place that in a sealed envelope. And Robbie Douglas, our business manager, is the only one who will open those and, and log those in. And he'll send you a statement once a quarter to let you know where you stand. And that's just for your personal personal um, upkeep. If you're visiting with us, please don't feel awkward or obligated to give. If your heart tells you you want to give, certainly follow your heart, but don't feel obligated. This is for those of us who have stood before this congregation and said, I pledge to support this church with my prayers, my presence, my gifts, my service, and my witness. My dear friends, the book of James reminds us that if we say we are followers of Christ, we need to show the world by our speech, our service, and our giving that we are. May it be so for you and for me in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us come as we sing our closing hymn.